Gracious Father, how we praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your power and your grace at work. And we pray that we would delight in you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. Well, as I said, as Peter said as well, we are thinking this morning about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to imagine that you've, uh, you've gone to a party or you're at the bus stop and you meet someone and you get chatting and you chat for a little while, don't you? And then after a while you say, oh, what do you do then? And you, you hope it's nothing weird. It's kind of a normal question, isn't it? It tells you about someone and you kind of understand them. And now I want you to imagine that you're at the party or you're at the bus stop and you get chatting and you're, it turns out you're chatting to uh, the Holy Spirit. Just work with me for a moment. And you're chatting to the Holy Spirit and you say, well, what do you do then? I wonder what you think the answer would be. Just what is it that is the work of the Holy Spirit? And that's what we're going to think about together this morning. Uh, Just if you're new or or visiting us, you're really welcome just to explain. Um, So normally, we have a a sermon that works through a book of the Bible in series from from start to finish. And then I'm not allowed to skip the difficult bits and we hear what God is saying. But occasionally, we'll have a a kind of one-off sermon on a particular topic. And that's what we're doing this Sunday. So we've got this topic of the Holy Spirit. And we've been looking through John's gospel, and at various points in the last few weeks, the the Holy Spirit has come up. And so I wanted to spend a bit longer thinking about that. And you might be here, and you've done loads of thinking about the, the Holy Spirit in your Christian life. Or maybe you're here and you've not really reflected much about him at all. And we are going to be thinking this morning, these two questions, who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. So these two questions, who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to do that with a a couple of bits on the piece of paper that I've given out. Um, So you'll see, if you look at it, if you grab that in front of you, the first section, so the front and most of the back, that's our, we call it our, our kind of doctrinal basis. They're the key things that we believe as a church. Okay, so we want to know what we're all about as a church is these things. And I've put in bold the couple that we're looking at, especially today. And then if you look onto the back, so if you flip over onto the back, you'll see there's a little section from our church handbook. And that kind of explains, well, how do we operate as a church and, and how do we work? And we're going to be using those bits to help us today as we think about these two questions. And the first thing we're thinking about is who the Holy Spirit is. So who the Holy Spirit is. And I just wonder, I wonder if you've ever heard it described like this. So someone will say, The Holy Spirit is like the power of God in your life. Or the Holy Spirit is like the the spiritual petrol in your tank. Or or some people have got the the pilot light of the Holy Spirit. And they've got to have the full burn. Or or similar things like that. And I kind of, in one way, I get a bit of that. But if we want to understand the Holy Spirit, We need to know that he is a he. He is not a power, but a person. That the Holy Spirit is not a power, but a person. So sometimes I might, uh, I might, if I was feeling particularly generous, I might describe Becca as the light of my life. Okay, she is the light of my life. But you wouldn't misunderstand that. You wouldn't think, oh, well, she's just like a torch, and he kind of flicks her on and off. No, you'd think that's just a way of explaining a part of who she is. And so it is with the Holy Spirit, a real person, a member of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
to be related to and known about and loved and worshipped. So we've got a sermon today about delighting in a person. This is not a physics lesson about power. It is delighting in a person. And so I want you to grab that little section of the, the basis that you've got in front of you. And just want to be clear, this is entirely based on how we understand the Bible. So this is not removed from the Bible. It's not something that we've just made up. This is how we'd sum up what the Bible says on these important topics. So we're going to have the Bible open a bit less today, but we've got it kind of summarized on here. So just look with me at that first one. There is one God who exists eternally in three distinct but equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is unchangeable in his holiness, justice, wisdom, and love. He is the almighty creator, savior, and judge who sustains and governs all things according to his sovereign will for his own glory. Do you see how that's quite a long way from a pilot light or a petrol tank, isn't it? That the Holy Spirit is one of these persons of the Trinity. That the Holy Spirit is personal God, just like the Father and the Son. So if you're here and you think, well, what do we believe as a church? We believe that there is a God who is real, and knowable God who is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we don't think about the Holy Spirit, you know, a bit like the force in Star Wars, and it's a bit this sort of mysterious power, and some people have got this mysterious power. No, not something to be channeled and used, but a person to be related to, a glorious member of the Trinity. So what does that mean? It means, doesn't it, that we worship and love the Holy Spirit as God. That we bow before him in wonder and adoration as our sovereign God, a blessed member of the Trinity. Everything that God the Father is, all wisdom and holiness and justice and mercy and grace and power. Everything that God the Father is except for being the Father but instead being the Spirit. So we pray, don't we, to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. When we baptize believers, it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Not one God and two creatures. Not a a Father and a Son and a sort of impersonal force. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the work of the Spirit His goal in the world, what he's doing, it is united with the work of the Father and the Son. The glory of God in saving men and women like you and me from hell and destruction. I was thinking about this in terms of tax. And so tax has been quite a lot in the news this week, hasn't it? Um, How your taxes are going to go up or down in the budget. And if you were employed by someone and you pay tax on that employment, so I'm employed by the church, you are allowed to earn some money tax-free. So you're allowed to take on a little job and you can earn a thousand pounds. I don't know whether that's changed in this budget, I very much doubt it. So you can earn a thousand pounds on your side hustle before you have to pay tax. So if I wanted, I could earn my money as a pastor and I could also earn a bit on the side as a a yoga coach or a, a hairdresser or a dog walker. Um, I haven't started the yoga coaching yet, only a matter of time. But you've got this side hustle, and we can be tempted to think that the Holy Spirit is a bit like that, that God the Father has the job of creating and ruling, and the Son is saving and loving, and the Holy Spirit has a kind of side hustle. His job's something cool over there, not connected with the Father or the Son. That is not the picture. The Father and the Son and the Spirit, they might have 
different roles within the plan. But they are working in the same direction. For the same glory. The glory of God through saving lost women like men, like you and me. And as a church, we're about the hope of life, aren't we? The hope of forgiveness. And the hope of knowing God. And we're all about that because the Holy Spirit is all about that. That God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit is the almighty creator, saviour and judge. Who sustains and governs all things according to his sovereign will for his own glory. God himself, the spirit of Christ, not distinct and and separate over here somewhere. The spirit who makes Christ real to us shows us God. That's who he is. God to be worshipped. But let's move on, and you're, you're at the bus stop, and you say, well, what do you do? I found out a bit about who you are. What do you do? What do you do? And I want to start this section with a thought, okay? Uh, someone mentioned it to me the other day, and I, I got thinking, if the Holy Spirit left the church, would anyone notice? And you get that question, but I want to sharpen it for us. If the Holy Spirit left our church, Would anyone notice? And I want to answer that by reading another section from what you have in front of you. So just flip onto the back and look at um, the the other bit in bold on the back. Is it seven? Number seven, is that right? Yeah, great. So this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit has been sent from heaven to glorify Christ and to apply his work of salvation. He convicts sinners, imparts spiritual life, and gives a true understanding of the Scriptures. He indwells all believers, bringing assurance of salvation, and produces increasing likeness to Christ. He builds up the church and empowers its members for worship, service, and mission. And so that follows on, doesn't it, from what we were talking about earlier, that the Spirit does the work of God, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are doing the same work, but not all in the same way, that the Father sends the Son, okay, the Son doesn't send the Father, that the Son dies on the cross, not the Father, and the unique work about the Spirit is what we read here. That the Spirit glorifies Christ and applies his work of salvation. That he convicts sinners and imparts life. That by him we understand the scriptures. That he indwells all believers and makes us like Christ. That he builds up the church and empowers us for worship, service and mission. I think we'd notice if he wasn't here. We wouldn't have a church, would we? We wouldn't be here. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no Christians. I want you to imagine that we come into a church without the Spirit. Okay, imagine we walk into this church and the Spirit's not there. And you, first of all, you think, well, why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here? We'd have no interest in praising God, would we? We'd have no need of forgiveness because we wouldn't feel any guilt. There would be no salvation because there would be no spiritual life. All efforts to be godly, to be more like Jesus, they'd just make us Pharisees. Because we wouldn't be more like Jesus. And you'd sit and and listen to the sermon and it would make no sense. Uh, Maybe you think that sometimes. But it would make absolutely no sense, not just the difficult bits. And I wouldn't understand it. And you wouldn't understand it. I might as well preach in in Latin or Chinese. And we wouldn't have any worship or we wouldn't have any service and we wouldn't have any mission. Because there, the Holy Spirit is at work. And if we didn't have the Spirit, we wouldn't be a church. We'd be like the Bowls Club or, or the WI or or any other kind of social group. 
there would be no lie. And never mind any other churches, we're not speaking about them. Would we notice if the Spirit wasn't here? You bet your life we would. There'd be none of the life that we've got. Or maybe you get the idea that there's churches and then Spirit-filled churches. The churches are okay, but they're Spirit-filled churches. They're like another level. They're like the kind of icing on the cake. That's not how it is. That the Holy Spirit makes the church and brings life to the church. And without the Spirit, there is no church. There is no cake. There's no connection to Jesus or worship of him. That the Holy Spirit at work makes Jesus real for us. If you feel your sin, if you know that you've done wrong, that you know you need forgiveness, there the Spirit is at work. If you hear the Bible, and even in in some way you think, oh, I need to do this. There, the Spirit is at work. If you feel like you want to grow and be more like Jesus, there, the Spirit is at work. And sometimes people will talk about the Holy Spirit, and they'll say, well, he's like the shy member of the Trinity. I hate that. I kind of get the point, but I don't like that. It's not the Spirit is somehow less bold. But his job is to glorify Christ and bring Christ to us. So do you know when the the, the, the kind of king is coming in and the guys on the trumpet are blowing the trumpet and saying the king is coming in, you don't look at them and you say, well, they're just very shy because they're not talking about themselves. That's not the point, is it? They are there to glorify the king and the spirit makes Christ real to us. Now, I just want to say a word if you're here and you are just here thinking about Christian things. Maybe that's you. And sometimes we can make it sound like being a Christian is just about acknowledging Jesus or just about admitting that we've done wrong and need forgiveness, something that we do and then it's done. And all those things are good and right. But to be a Christian is to be spiritually united with God. To have a relationship with the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Entirely the work of God through his Spirit in your life. Something absolutely mind-blowing. Let me read to you again that passage from John 14. I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you'll realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is what it is to be a Christian. To not be alone. To not be alone. To not be living life by your abilities, for your glory. To not be simply me, 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 me. It is to have the Holy Spirit within us. That the Holy Spirit is within us, leading us and shaping us and filling our hearts with the Lord Jesus. Maybe there are times in your life that you feel so stuck in your own head. You ever have that? You just hear your voice going over and over again. God's promise is the Spirit within each one of us. Making each one of us slowly over time into the person we know that we should be, but we know that we're not. This is the promise of the Spirit. And just to be totally clear, every single Christian has the Spirit. Okay, there's not Christians and then Christians with the Spirit. There's not two levels. Every single Christian has been given 
the gift of the Spirit. Why? Because without it, you can't be a Christian. Without the Spirit, you can't be united to Jesus. And we have very God himself living within us. Shaping us and changing us and making us more like the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Let me read to you that section from our handbook. Just have a look at then the last little bit on the sheet. At Hope Community Church, we desire to live a spirit-filled life. Not quenching the spirit, but fanning into flame the spiritual life God wants us to enjoy for his glory and our good. We desire to see people born again, transformed, enjoying a personal relationship with God and open to the Spirit's leading in their life. Do you see how personal that is? I really like this bit, by the way. I I can say that because I didn't write it. I think it's really, really helpful, isn't it? And don't we know, you know, I mean, I'm nervous here standing up to do a sermon about the Spirit because... Don't we know over the past decades how controversial it's been, how churches have been split and people have been really hurt as people have focused on particular aspects of his work. And I would say forgotten his major work of uniting us together and uniting us to the Lord Jesus. And these kind of discussions about whether People would speak in tongues today, or, or, or what about healings? They, they are moved into perspective as we worship the Holy Spirit as God with us, within each one of us, that every Christian has the Spirit. And everyone who is not a Christian is invited into relationship with God by the Spirit. And how does he change us? How does he change us? We've said already that we're here to worship God as Father, Son, and Spirit. And he is a person, a genuine relational person. Uh, You see that? I've not got the the Bible references here, but I've just got a few of the, the things that the Bible says he has a mind and he thinks. That he has deep affections and feelings. That he has a will and makes choices. That he talks and testifies that he encourages us and strengthens us and teaches us and that he can be lied to and insulted and blasphemed in every way a person to know and to love. Now we could spend ages on each one of these things. But we're just going to, as we come near the end, we're going to focus on two particular things just from the handbook. At Hope Community Church, we desire to live a spirit-filled life, fanning into flame the spiritual life, that our life, that our community, that our church family is marked by likeness to Jesus, increasing joy in the work of God, increasing love for one another, increasing service, increasing mission. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Let me read to you again from those verses in Ephesians 5. They're on the the bottom of the sheet if you want to look at them. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And you think, well, okay, Paul, how do I do that? What does that look like? Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That to be filled with the Spirit is to have our community life changed by the Spirit within us. We're filled with the Spirit and how we behave to one another and how we behave to God. And you read that in Acts as well. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit in Acts? To have courage and boldness to speak the word of God. 
to declare to those around us the glories of Jesus and his resurrection power. That the Spirit is declaring the glories of Christ. And to be Spirit-filled means to do that. And isn't that what we long for? Isn't that what we pray for? That we would be filled to overflowing with the glories of Christ. We desire to see people born again, transformed, enjoying a personal relationship with God and open to the Spirit's leading. Isn't that what we pray? That the Spirit would shape us. And finally, let's have a look at the last bit. We desire to live a spirit-filled life, not quenching the spirit. What does it mean? It means to ignore his voice. When he speaks to us about Christ through his word, we quench the spirit when we put him on mute, when we put our fingers in his e- our ears and we don't want to hear what he's got to say. And through this section of John, we've seen he glorifies Jesus. He brings Jesus to us and he brings his word to our heart and we quench the spirit when we mute that voice. When we do not allow God's words through the Bible to speak in our lives. And we need to listen. And what would it look like to ignore him? I think we know. I think we know when the spirit has been speaking to our hearts through the word And we just, we forget about that bit of the sermon. Or maybe we focus on a a little detail in the sermon. But actually we ignore the big thing. I was in, I don't know if you've ever been in a group like this, but I was in a group once where we we loved talking about the Bible. And we would talk about all the the little details of the passage. I wonder what this little complicated bit means and the, the technical questions. And we'd look at all the different Bible translations And we spent almost no time changing our lives. Ever been in a group like that? Because that's the uncomfortable bit. When the Holy Spirit wants to change my life. Oh, I knew a a gentleman who would always come up at the end of the sermon and he would ask a question. But it wasn't ever about how does this change my life? It was a technical question or a question about other people. And that can be our heart. I wonder how this would apply to them over there. I wonder what you do at the end of a sermon. When the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, that's what it looks like to, to put out his voice. Say, I'm not bothered about that. It's lovely, isn't it, when we chat at the end of the service. We need to give time and space for the Spirit to be at work in this rush, rush work. That he glorifies Christ by making us like him. Well, we started with those two questions. Who is he? God. The spirit of the father and the son. And that makes what he's come to do so incredible. To make God real to us. That every single believer has the spirit. Isn't that worthy of our worship and our praise? A delight in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God at work in us.